Well, I'm very excited to have Dr. Barry Stranick with us this afternoon. Um, sorry, um, Barry uh, was a lieutenant in the Salu Scouts um, and has a very interesting story to tell. He also was in the RLI and also was a, uh, a mercenary in the Congo fighting with Mike Hall in, I think, Five Commander, but he'll tell us more about that. Barry, really nice to have you with us, brother. Please fire away. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Well, I'll, I'll briefly go right back to uh, my early life. I was born in Durban, and I was raised in St. Martin's home. My parents got divorced, and uh, my mother had custody of us, and she couldn't afford to keep us, so she placed me and my elder brother in St. Martin's home. Uh, a really rough and tough place. I was there for six years, and uh, being a redhead, full of freckles, and skinny and short, I was picked on regularly, so I kind of developed anger issues and a bit of a chip on my shoulder. So fighting was a thing I got involved with at a very, very early age. It was either that or you died, you know, it's a question <laughs> of survival. Uh, whilst at St. Martin's home, I went to Westridge, which was a junior school for youngsters with learning difficulties. I had ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, uh, which you may or may not know is uh, a condition that affects people psychologically. I was very impatient, impetuous, loved excitement, got bored very easily with things, couldn't concentrate. So uh, Westridge was the place to sort me out. And that was also notoriously rough school. Then my mother remarried when I was about 12. Uh, and we moved up to Nyasaland, which is Malawi today. And our house was right on the edge of the small neighborhood that we had. At the bottom of our garden was a small river and the bush behind it. And of course, most weekends and afternoons, I was in the bush. Weekends, I'd be with my mates playing soldiers in the bush. And from there, I learned to get to know the bush quite well. I left school at the end of 1961. I was 16 years old. I'd only achieved uh, Form 4, which I think is Grade 11 today. And leaving school without COP or A-levels or O-levels was a bit difficult. So life was going to be difficult right from the word go. But it's just interesting, and I'll come to it a little bit later on. Uh, you may or may not recall Scott McCormack from the SAS. Scott McCormack, I think at that time in 1961, mid-1961, was either in the immigration or the customs in Iceland. And he dabbled in karate. Uh, I had boxed off and on from the early age, started off in Samantha's home. And then I got interested when I saw Scott doing a bit of karate. I don't recall where he learned that from, but uh, I started training with him. I uh, then had a year kind of sabbatical, and when I was 18, I joined the RLI. You know, my whole perception of, the, of joining the army was that I was going to be given a rifle and a uniform and sent out to go and kill people. <laughs> uh, anyway, I signed up KG6. They drove me by Land Rover to RLI. And uh, I vividly remember driving through the front gates and feeling a, a, a warm, comfortable feeling of refuge which unfortunately was soon to end, having been dropped off. I got out of the Land Rover outside HQ and uh, was standing leaning against a pillar near the armory, having a cigarette, uh, still with a kind of a ductile hairstyle. And that mean machine, Tom van Rensburg, came around the corner, saw me there and screamed at me. And uh, I wasn't quite sure how to take it, you know, usually... When someone screams at you, you want to have a, a, a knuckle and dance with them. But I realized, you know, I saw he was a corporal. I thought better of it. My instinct told me, stay calm, chum, which I did. So that was the end of this nice refuge, home from home <laughs> feeling I had. And then, of course, uh, we had to wait for a few other guys to arrive before the group boards actually started. And I remember doing gardening, planting grass or whatever, because Cranbourg Barracks was still quite... You then. Then the, the, the shock of the recruit course hit home. It was screaming, shouting, 
shrine parades, PT, log runs, and we never ever walked anywhere. We ran everywhere. Uh, we did drill until our heels ached, and I'll never forget those awful khaki KD shorts that we had. I'm sure they made them for us to humiliate people even more, the <laughs> huge pants that we had to starch. In fact, we starched them so stiffly that if you undid the buckle and the fly and you dropped your pants, they would stand up on their own and you just got out of them, you know? <laughs> Dreadful things. Anyway, there were shiny brasses, boating boots, blank coming belts, Barrack room inspections, starching KD shorts. Uh, then, of course, there was an awful RSM inspections. At that time, RSM Reed Daily was our, our RSM. And that's where I quickly learned all about escape and evasion. Uh, some of the notable guys on our recruit course was Henry Pretorius, who went to SAS. Rob McNeilish, who became RSM of Signals. Naughty little Terry O'Leary. Rob Murray, who I think was uh, OC of the MPs, TC Woods, who went to uh, SAS, extremely fit guy, very nice fellow, George Moffat, Jack Cohen, and of course, Bob, uh, Bill Manning, Bob Beecham, and uh, Tom van Rensburg. Anyway, after the 16 week course, uh, recruit course, I was proud to pass out of the Green Beret 3078, Private Stradic and posted to uh, C Company. I actually passed out as the best recruit on our recruit course. Then, of course, real life set in with Pomona Guard and the drill and guard duty and all that dreadful type of stuff. And, you know, I soon became very, very bored. Uh, in 1963, uh, there were rumors of uh, a golden handshake that the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasla was going to break up and we would be given the opportunity to take a golden handshake and leave if we had a side under the Federal Army. These rumours of mercenary starting up excited me. I was getting bored with the RLI. Uh, I wanted action, typical ADHD problems, you know. So in December 1963, I took the golden handshake and regrettably, you know, it was the worst decision I think I ever made in my life, leaving RLI. If only I had just been a little bit more patient, the war would have started, I would have been chuffed. So, uh, yeah. So I left in December 63 and presented myself to the uh, mercenary recruiting office. And they turned me down because I wasn't yet 21. Of course, I didn't know that. I thought they took you at any age. So now here I am, I've left the RLI, they won't take me at five commando. What am I going to do for the next year? No money in my pocket, no education to get a decent job. So yeah, for that year it was tough. Anyway, I survived. I then came down to, I hitchhiked down to Cape Town and signed up at the recruiting office there. What I did was I took my birth certificate, I was born in 1945, and I got a razor blade and I just scraped off the top of the five and converted it to a three. So I put the little stroke on the left hand side. So now I was of age. So I presented that, I signed up. And the next day at midnight, we flew out of Cape Town Airport. Uh, well, you know, when I arrived at the airport, I saw all these mercenaries. Now I'm only a, a youngster of 20 years old. You know, guys in like their 30s and 40s. And uh, I felt a little bit intimidated. And then, of course, some of the guys who were going back for a second contract were talking about just how bad things were there. And I thought, oh, oh what the hell have I let myself in for? <laughs> anyway, it was a long flight. A lot of guys got drunk on the way. It was an awful flight. And I can remember just before we landed at Alpenville, I could see a streak of oil going over the wing from out of the engine. And I thought we weren't going to make it anyway. They shut that engine down just as the Albertville airstrip came into view. And as we came in, I looked out the window and I could see all these burnt down armored cars, uh, a replica of uh, uh, the battles that had gone on there. And I again thought, oh, hell, what am I doing? So as we landed, we had a quick pep talk. Uh, a lot of guys, well, not a lot of guys, a few guys thought, no, they didn't want to join. And we were told, anyone who doesn't want to join, just come stand this side and we'll fly you back. You can go back to Cape Town. So quite a few guys flew off immediately. 
And we then ran to Albertville. We had uh, two weeks of retraining. Uh, and I was uh, posted to 52 Commando. And shortly thereafter, I was uh, promoted to a sergeant because of my regular army experience. 52 Commando became 2-5 Commando, a second battalion of 5 Commando. And I was posted up north, uh, right on the Sudan border. And uh, things were really tough there weren't well organized. My commanding officer up there was Major Peter Johnson, and my officer commanding was Captain Hufford Offen, quite a, a famous guy. Uh, and we were told that what had happened was the previous contract had eliminated a lot of the, the rebels, the Simba rebels. But when they moved on, because everything was like columns in those days, we, they drove in, shot up the town, took the town, the Army National Congolese regular troops would come in and garrison it. But of course, when they left, when the fire commander had gone, all the Simba rebels just came back in again. They filled the vacuum. Now, the garrison troops weren't the best because they just ran away. So we had to now start retaking all these villages and, and, and these towns. The rebels were coming back through Uganda and through the Sudan border. Of course, they're not a border as such. You could just walk across it. So we had our, our work cut out for us. The Congo War, I must say, right from the outset, was far worse than anything I'd ever seen in Rhodesia because the intensity of the war up there was far, far worse. The amount of rebels versus us, they far outnumbered us and outgunned us. So, yeah, it was, it was really, really hectic. And in that first contact, if we went a week without being in a contact with the rebels, you know, we felt good. It was excellent. A bit of a rest. My first contact, I remember you asking me this question. Now, this sticks in my mind very vividly. Two weeks after we had arrived, I was tasked with taking my little platoon or troop on a recce com combat uh, patrol along a road that we had been given intelligence from civilians that there was a buildup of rebels in that area. So uh, we got out of our vehicles and drove in the direction. Then there was a small village where I decided to park the vehicles there and then walk from there, foot patrol. So we all debussed. I took up the lead, walked in front, took up our normal patrolling on either side of the road. We'd got about 5Ks. It was a cool, coolish morning. The birds were singing. The sun was coming up. Everything was nice and peaceful. Uh, the scenery was nice. You know, thick jungle up there. There's a rainforest jungle. Not anything open as we sort of know it in Rhodesia. And we just started to walk up a gentle rise. And I got to the top of the rise and I looked down and I saw a bridge about 50 meters away, a thick jungle on the other side. To my left was a slight rise, thick jungle. To my right was a little bit open, then thick jungle. And a little river at the bottom, which was a little bit open. And then all of a sudden, they started firing. They set the ambush. The, the firing was so intense, John, that it sounded like rain on a corrugated iron roof. So uh, anyway, now I'm in view of the, of the, of the, the rebels. There possibly two guys behind me. But the rest of the guys could not see because they're on the back of the rise. So I called up a couple of them and tactically placed them to the right and we were trying to win the firefight. But I needed more fire. The bloke with the bread gun was a few people behind me. So I got up and ran back, picked up the bread gun, grabbed a few magazines in his uh, uh, magazine pouch and started running back. And as I ran back up to take my position at the, at the, at the head, a guy, a rebel, ran out of the jungle. I still remember a short little guy in a kind of a blue overall. And he opened up on me with a PPSH, which we used to call a burp gun. And uh, I was hit in the right calf. Uh, it wasn't painful or anything. I just felt a little knock on my right calf. And uh, I sprayed him with a bread gun from the hip as I was running. Fortunately, managed to kill him. Uh, then I took up position again where I originally was and we started firing. 
Uh, we shortly ran out of, started running out of ammunition. The firing was still very, very intense. Uh, so I decided there's no way we're going to get through this lot. And before I have any casualties, uh, I thought we'd do a tactical withdrawal, which we did. I managed to get the guys over to the right-hand side of the road into the thick jungle, uh, where it was easier to walk than to the left, because obviously there was a killer group on the left-hand side where this fellow had run out at me and fired at me. I didn't want to run into their killer group, so we ducked down and went into the jungle and slowly made our way back through the jungle, whistling to keep in contact with each other. Then the rebels started firing RPGs, RPG-7s, and of course they hit the trees, and fortunately none of us were, were hit at all. Uh, so we gradually continued to withdraw. The pace was very slow because the jungle was thick. Uh, and as we were doing this now, the rebels were all happy that they had five commander on the back foot and we were running away. So they started ululating and shouting and they were obviously happy as hell. So we'd walked a couple of k's, we got out of the initial ambush. Uh, my leg wasn't too sore at that time, but I could feel the blood in my boot was scratching. But anyway, we continued still keeping contact with each other by low whistles. We probably got a couple of k's. But I thought, to hell with this now, I think I'm going to set up an ambush. So as soon as we reached the point in the road where the road curved, I set up an ambush there with a killer group, and I was to initiate the ambush, just in case these guys thought they were going to come after us. And they did. After about half an hour, I could hear voices, and about 15 of these rebels were walking down the road towards us, I still remember the guy in the front had a, a monkey fur hat on his head, no rifle, had his stick, and a tucker of pistol in his hand. And they were laughing and joking as they were going. Uh, and then, of course, we kept very quiet. And finally, I decided it was time to open up, and I opened up, hitting the, the, the officer in the chest, and he went down. Then, of course, we just sprayed the hell out of anything. And after we had done a... Uh, 360, we discovered that we'd actually killed 13 of the 15, which was good. A couple had got away. So we had had the, the last laugh. So what we did then was drag them onto the road. Some had gone into the bush and died there, into the jungle. We pulled them all onto the road and lined them up in case any of the others thought they were going to come after us. So, uh, yeah, that was my first big contact. Uh, it was the biggest contact that I had ever been in. The, the noise was unbelievable. I really didn't think I was going to get out of it. But fortunately, I was the only guy that was wounded and nobody else was wounded, so I was quite chuffed with that. It, at that stage, we didn't have any real medics. We didn't have a hospital. We didn't have proper transport. Vehicles were liberated from civilians. We didn't have radios to make contact with HQ or anything. So I, just, you know, I realized I made the right move there by getting out during that tactical withdrawal. Uh, then, of course, there was a lot of patrolling and what have you. We saw action regularly. Things were tough. Conditions were tough. Uh, as I said, no rations. Things were very unorganized in, in the beginning. Then I was posted even further north to a place called Yakaluku, which is right up on the, Kong, uh, on the Sudanese border. And, uh, yeah, we were fairly busy there for quite some time. Then at the end of con contracts were six month contracts. We went up for six six months. We came back home for two weeks. Up for six, went back home for two weeks. I did uh, three contracts, which was eighteen months. Very very few people did more than one contract. That's how heavy it was. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of some notable people: Cully Berger, who was from RLI; Nick Hammond, also from RLI. And by the way, they also had won the military cross for gallantry, which was the Congo's highest gallantry medal. Barry Bogard is another one who was up there. Uh, yeah, then at the end of my contract in December 65, the day before we were going to pull out, uh, two big trucks arrived with Armed National Congolese military police. Uh, they jumped off and arrested all of us. We were driven to Paulus, which is a small town not too far from where we were. From Paulus, we were flown to Stanleyville. 
at a Stadleville, uh, there were a whole lot of vehicles lined up with military police there. We were disarmed, obviously, and escorted to the Stadleville jail, uh, where we all remained for a couple of days. Then all my guys were released, and I was left uh, behind on my own. I wasn't fully aware of why I had been arrested, but it's a very long story, and I note it all in my book, Demand the Brave Heart. Uh, I mentioned quite a bit about the Congo, I go into quite a lot of detail in there, so the whole story is in there. Uh, 1966, I went back again, but besides the normal mercenary work, I was doing other things, which is, I mentioned in detail in my book called Assassin's Vengeance. Okay, so quite a long, complicated story, so we don't have the time to go through that. Uh, then my last contract in 1966, things were quiet as far as the rebels were concerned. Che Guevara, who had a group of a couple of hundred Cuban troops with him, had fled across the lake back to Tanzania. He had got a good start squirt and quite a number of Cubans had been killed in Fiji and Baraka. Uh, but interestingly, in the last contract in 66, the Kataguese, I can't remember the exact history of the whole thing, but the Kataguese rebelled against the, the government and the Armenian National Congolese, who we were employed by. So I was sent up to a place called Shibunda to stop the Kataguese coming down that route. Uh, but of course, that all came to nothing. That would have been quite a punch up because uh, the Kataguese were very good, brave soldiers. Uh, so that was the end of my history of the Congo. Then, 67, returned, early 67, returned to South Africa. And shortly thereafter, I uh, decided to return to Rhodesia, called a train. And at Francistown, I don't know if anyone recalls, the Irish Fusiliers were monitoring Rhodesia's comms. And as we stopped at the Francistown railway station, these three Irish Fusiliers who'd had a few too many drinks were running up and down, uh, intimidating people, calling us white racists. And I just couldn't handle it, so I had a bit of a set to with them in the passenger cabin. They ran outside, I chased them, ran along the platform, they ran into the bush. The other two split off, one ran this way, the others ran the other way, and uh, had a bit of a punch up there and sorted them out and back on the train and back to Rhodesia. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so that was the Irish Fusiliers put in place. Back in Rhodesia, uh, I still tried to join the RLR for years. I tried to rejoin the RLR. But we had been warned that if you left the RLR with the breakup of the Federation, they would never take you back. So that, plus me being a mercenary, uh, there was no way I was going to get back to RLR. But uh, I tried for years to get back into RLR, but they wouldn't take me. So I was posted to one RR, one Rhodesia Regiment. And I was with one RR until 1969. At the end of 1969, uh, we were still doing foot patrols. We were based at Makuti, and then our forward base was Rikomachi. And we used to do foot patrols to Kanyemba and back again. There wasn't much action in those days, but uh, anyway, it was, it, was, it was interesting and exciting. But, you know, we would see the Big Five almost every day, because that, that area, of course, is Mana Pools. Yeah. So we bumped into line quite regularly, elephant on a daily basis. Uh, I can remember being charged by a black rhino once. That was a narrow escape. I also talk about that in my book in, in much more detail. Then uh, at the end of October 69, I went overseas. I just finished a, a call up, went overseas to compete in the uh, World Karate Championships. Now, I got involved with the karate with Scott McCormack, as I mentioned earlier, who happened to go to SAS in later years. So off I went overseas, attended the World Championships, and uh, I was a fairly junior guy. I think I was only a first dad at the time. But I managed to get to the, the top 10 of the World Championships, and I then decided to remain in Paris, which is where the championships were, and trained with a Japanese instructor called uh, Yoshinao Nanbu, 
for three months. And then I went across to England and trained with several Japanese karate instructors there. I then returned to Rhodesia in 1972 and continued doing my call-ups until 1977. Now, this was a lucky moment for me. Still being involved in the karate, I was called to do a grading uh, seminar with some of the black uh, black belts in, uh, in Harare, Salisbury, as it was in those days. And in that group was a young, very good little karate girl called Nikki Lumbrecht, whose father was Major Lumbrecht, the recruiting officer. <laughs> so after we had done the grading, I graded her the first day, I sidled up to him after Rob McNeely, she told me he was the recruiting officer. And I said to him, you know what, I've been trying to get back into the oil life for years. I made a big mistake. I left the breakup of the Federation, told him the whole story. And I said, please, but I'd really like to rejoin the Army. He said, okay, leave it with me. I'll see what I can do, but I can't promise. About a week later, I got a letter from him telling me that uh, they would accept me into the Army again as a color sergeant. I was a WO2 in one RR. I think, actually, I was the youngest WO2 in the Rhodesian Army at that stage. Uh, so, yeah, I was chuffed as anything. The only thing I wasn't chuffed about was that I was posted to Llewellyn Barracks. When I questioned that, they said, no, they better, you know, that's just to get you back into the key. You've got to go and do a couple of more courses and what have you, which I did. I did a couple of courses to the weapons and water six and what have you at Wello. And uh, there I was at Llewellyn Barracks. Not the happiest guy in the world. I wanted to go to the front. But I would have to be patient and just bide my time. And then one day... I was walking to the hangar where the SAS were having their selection course. And uh, as I was walking there, I bumped into Boyd Sutherland, Alistair Boyd Sutherland. He was a major at that time. Now, in the early days when I was in he was a lieutenant. We had a little bit of a punch-up. I didn't know who he was. We had a little bit of a punch-up at the cock door. And uh, <laughs> he never, ever held that against me. And as he approached me, he said, Mary Stratton, what the hell are you doing here? I said, hello, sir. I felt very embarrassed. I said, I've just been posted here. I've just rejoined the army. And we chatted for a couple of minutes. He said, listen, we need guys like you at Sally Scott. Wouldn't you like to come and join Sally Scott? I had vaguely heard about Sally Scott. I wanted to join SAS. That was what I really wanted to get into. Anyway, he convinced me Sally Scott was the place to go. So he said, come with me. So he walked down to his vehicle. He got it. The radio he called up uh, Rodri Daly. He said, guess who I've got you? He said, who? Harry Strady. He said, what the F is he doing there? So he told Reed Daly what was going on. He, he says he's quite keen to join us. He said, get him down here now. And within two days, I was at Scouts. Uh, Did you have to do yeah, selection course, Barry? Yep, I'm getting to that. Okay. I'm getting to that. <laughs> so, yeah, I was posted to training troop. I spent a couple of months there, and I thought, no, again, I want to get out of this training troop business. I want to go to the shop end. But just before I did the selection course, I was sent to uh, do an officer's course at Guelo. And I passed out as a lieutenant in December 78. I then decided to do the selection course. I did the selection course. I was the second oldest guy to do it. I was 34 at the time. I think the oldest guy to ever do it was 36. Uh, I might be mistaken there. So after doing the selection course, I was then posted to two group, five troopers, a troop commander doing pseudo work. The first bit of pseudo work I did was at Rusapi. Did a couple of OPs there. And I remember on my first trip, we managed to get a, a very good kill rate via fire force. I think it was something like 83 gooks in three days, which is quite good. Then I was posted to uh, Buffalo Range to link up with five troops. Even five troops, and I started uh, doing pseudo work from there. Most of my pseudo work was in uh, the Agenda and the Chibi Tribal Trust land. Now, Chibi was one of the hottest areas in the whole country. And I mentioned in my book a couple of interesting stories there. Uh, you wanted to know, I've, let me just explain a little bit about uh, the selection course first, I think. Uh, yeah, we were driven down to Kariba on uh, and closed vehicles. We got out of the vehicles. We then had to fill a bag. 
uh, with gravel. There was a pile of road gravel on the side of the road. Filled the bag with road gravel and we had to run 18 k's to Wafa Wafa. Wafa Wafa, for those who don't know, means you'll die, you'll die. <laughs> so we uh, arrived with those who did arrive. A hell of a lot of guys dropped out immediately. I don't know what they were thinking, but uh, certainly about half of the guys dropped out immediately. And on arrival at the lake, we were then shocked to realize that we had to go and sit in the, the lake. Now, you know, Chirara area where Wafa Wafa training camp was, was a hell of a lot of crocodiles. So we ran and exhausted. It was nice to sit in the cool water, but of course, you were doing 360s with the head all the time looking for the crocs. <laughs> we sat there for a few hours, then we were told to get up and go and build a basher. Uh, and of course, the run in, of course, was through Chirara, which is lion country, eh? probably the most uh, inhabited place with, with lions. Uh, we'd bump into them quite often. So that was my introduction to the selection course. We still weren't sure exactly how bad it was going to be, but there was going to be a hell of a lot worse to come. Uh, having made the basher, we did, relaxed. Next morning, we were up at 4.30. We started the log runs, which was about 8 k's across the uh, airstrip, up the gobble, down the gobble, and back. Then we do hundreds of never-ending sit-ups and deep, deep bends and press-ups and one thing and another. And of course, you know, when you're running on rough ground with a, a big gun pole on your shoulders between four of you, you're all running at different paces. So this big, heavy log is flashing your shoulder. It was, it was terrible. So we all had raw shoulders. So the first few uh, days of Stellar Scout was all about the physical aspect. They just wanted to run us into the ground. And guys were just dropping out one after the other. Uh, the whole thing was to uh, to really exhaust us and push us to the limit. For the first couple of days, we had no food, only water. There was no rest. We ran everywhere. We were kept on the go. At night when we were exhausted, we had to stand around a fire singing songs. So it was all about sleep deprivation, uh, food deprivation, intense physical training that would wear you down, you know. After about a week, we were extremely weak. But after a few days, luckily, they decided they were going to give us something to eat. And we had noticed that there'd been a baboon that was hanging for a couple of days from a tree there. So the baboon had to ripen, of course, before we were going to be dished up with baboon food. So our first meal was baboon rotting baboon meat uh, with all the maggots and what have you, plus sadza. So... As hungry as, as hungry as we were, the baboon didn't put us off. We just gobbled it all up. <laughs> uh, yeah, the dropouts continued. Some guys weren't prepared to eat baboon, so they dropped out immediately. Did that give you so diarrhea, there, Barry? Uh, Barry? Did you get yeah, diarrhea from that? <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually chew on the meat. I just took the juice, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it like soup. But yeah, times are going to get tough. Uh, on these downhill runs, I suffered an avulsion fracture of my left knee, which is where the tendon pulls away from the bone. But as it pulls away from the bone, it pulls the chunk of bone with it. So I had this huge lump on the left-hand side of my knee, which was excruciatingly painful. But of course, I didn't want to be put off the course, so I just kept quiet. I managed to strap it up for a while, but I mean, that didn't help too much. And running down those goggles or any running and walking was extremely painful. But I just stuck to it and dug my heels in and did whatever I could. Still very weak, still singing at night, still eating rubbish food. Then <clears throat> the boxing aspect. We were paired off and uh, we had to box. But of course, we had to thrash each other. You weren't allowed to lay, you know, take it easy. You really <laughs> had to thrash the guy. So, uh, yeah, we went through that. Then, of course, there was... This is, this is where, you, where your karate training made you uh, excel at that. <laughs> well, you know what? I didn't go too too hard. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I made it look like I was going hard. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to take advantage of anyone. In fact, the guys I was paired off with very, very nice guys. I can't remember the name, but they were very nice fellas. Then we were dropped off at Chirara at night on our own. Could hear the lions roaring. 
you weren't allowed to climb a tree. You had to stay on the ground. <clears throat> so he slept in one hour open the whole night. Another occasion after that had finished, we were dropped off in the bush. We were driven round and round in circles. We didn't know where the hell we were. They were dropped off and said, find your way back. And uh, we had to find our way back to, to Wafa Wafa. Then, uh, okay, after a few days, we loaded up our, we loaded up our uh, Aversacks <coughs> with 35 kgs of rocks for a 90-day march, two days to Makuti through the bush. Of course, the heat was sapping and you were bent over under the weight. Your hands would go numb from the pressure of the straps on your shoulders. Uh, and we were given two days. Again, guys dropped out there. I mean, it was hellish for us. Very, very weak. Carried this heavy road with your rifle. Then from Akuti, we ran back and walked back down the road, still with our uh, haversacks unloaded up. And then I made the decision on the road that I was going to run 500 meters and walk 500 meters. This was like the final run in now, towards the very end of the course. And along the road, they had all these little markers on the side of the road every 500 meters. I just put my head down and I jogged 500 meters, then walked 500 meters, jogged 500 meters. And I'm making good progress. So I'd left everybody else behind. And I was doing this because when I was a training trip before, went on the selection, one of the instructors said, sir, you're never going to make it. You're going down, there's a whole lot of fit NS guys. They've been training for this for three months. You're not going to make it, I can tell you. So I thought I'm going to have to put these guys in their place. So uh, eventually I arrived. Uh, but on the way there, I could hear the vehicle looking for me. But they weren't going far enough. I could hear them behind me, shouting and before me and whatever. Anyway, I arrived uh, quite a long time before all the other guys emptied all the, the rocks out. Then the next stage after that, they were all exhausted, I was back on the road again, then up this very steep combo called Gota Gota. Gota Gota means leaning forward like an old man because you had to <laughs> under the weight to get up the steep combo. And then it was down again. Not to mention how my leg was aching. It's extremely painful uh, at that time. But eventually we got back to Wafa Wafa and told we had passed. Now, you know, the Silver Scout selection course was reputed to be one of the, the toughest selection courses in the world. Uh, the selection guys were made up NS guys, white guys, black guys from all different uh, units. Uh, yeah, so that was that. And then, of course, after that, we got back to Wafa Wafa. We had two days rest. And then we went on our tracking course and exam. And this is where they slide us because on, as we tracked, we realized we were going straight back to the lake. And we walked directly to the lake, and there was a boat waiting. We were all put on the boat. We are taken to Starvation Island, where we were going to starve for the next 10 days. Uh, so they dumped us there, and off they went. So here we are, Starvation Island. There's nothing around to eat. We saw a group of impalas. We tried to catch a couple, tried to run them into the lake and swim up and catch one of them, but no way. They were just too clever. Anyway, one guy latched onto a leg of on, and we uh, ate the leg of on amongst ourselves. So that was it. Shortly thereafter, back to Kobo. I had an operation on my knee to fix the knee. A couple of weeks later, uh, we did our para course of Bloomfield Heat, which was in the middle of winter. And Bloomfield Heat gets icy cold in winter. Uh, so when, of course, you land, your feet hit the ground, you could feel the pain go through your feet. And there were just antlers for Africa. I was just lucky that uh, none of us actually fell on the antler and injured ourselves. So after that, it was back to Scouts. I then went to Buffalo Ridge and commenced by pseudo work. Uh, you wanted an explanation of how pseudo work actually works. But it's very, very complicated. So I'll just give you the very, very basics. Uh, each troop, pseudo troop, and by the way, there was, when I was doing pseudo work, I think there was only 16 pseudo operators at the time. So most people think that Salus Gus, everyone did pseudos. It wasn't like that at all. There's only 16 of us doing pseudo work. 
So each troop is commanded by a senior NCO or an officer. So what would happen is you would receive intelligence from SP guys that there was a, a terrorist group in a particular location. And uh, you would then have to prepare to go and find these fellows who would walk in, take up a uh, position. Now, because the troop commanders were mainly white guys, no matter how much black is beautiful you put on yourself, you could still identify that you were white because of your features. So we always would have to stay out of sight. The troop would then be deployed by the troop commander. The troop would have a radio, a guy with a radio. The troop commander would have a, two radios, TR-48 and the big beads. And you would then direct them as to what you wanted them to do. The main thing, of course, is to make contact when you arrived at the, the situation, the location where the terrorists were supposed to be. You'd have to contact the contact man. Uh, then you'd have to get through the contact man. Now, the contact man would be asking a lot of questions. Where did you come from? Where are you going to? What are you doing? You know, who's in charge of the group, et cetera, et cetera. And you couldn't make a mistake. Because then you wouldn't get past the contact man. Because the contact man is the guy that puts you in, in uh, communication with the terrorists. Anyway, once you pass the contact man, the contact man would then give a Mujiba, which is a youngster, a little letter written to the terrorist group that there's another terrorist group that's just arrived in the area and they want to beat you. So the Mujiba would run off with this little letter and deliver the letter. The, the terrorist group that's there would have a look at the letter, make up their mind what they wanted to do. They would then write a letter and the Mujiba would take that to the contact man. The contact man would get hold of the pseudo group and make arrangements to meet or they didn't want to meet one of the two. If they decided that there's something fishy, then you wouldn't meet the group and the whole thing would be a, become a lemon. If the, if the contact man was convinced and the terrorist group were convinced, then you would meet. Then the, the, the seriousness really started because now the, the terrorist group that's there, they're going to ask you a whole lot of different questions. There's certain passwords that you have to know. Uh, for instance, if you said uh, the password is President Robert G. Mugabe, if you said uh, President Mugabe, well, then that was the end of that. You've compromised immediately. Then they had foods that they weren't allowed to eat or wouldn't eat. So if you were dished up by the local villagers, chicken, say, for instance, which was a forbidden food for the terrorists, and you ate the chicken, you'd be compromised and you'd be in trouble. So it's a very, very risky thing all the time. And I think it's even more risky for the poor troop commander because he's on his own. And uh, I can tell you a brief little story about the agenda a little bit later on. They want to know uh, where you trained, the names of your instructors, the route you took to come in, prohibited foods, which I mentioned. And you just cannot make a mistake because these guys will take you out immediately. Uh, so, yeah. The little Majuba does all the running to and from. The idea then was to get them into a location where I could, as the troop commander, call in fire force to take them out. Very seldom would we take them out ourselves because we would have to go back there and operate again. So, of course, when fire force arrives on the scene and starts taking out, the, we all just disappear. A couple of days later, we come back and say, oh, that was bad. We ran away. Luckily, none of our guys were killed and blah, blah, blah. And then we would find out how many of the, the terrorists were actually killed, RLI or RAR, uh, fire force groups. So, uh, yeah, that's basically how it, it worked. Of course, calling in fire force, you'd have to know how to describe the location of where the terrorists actually are, describe the terrain, describe uh, escape routes, and all of that type of thing to help fire force as they flew in with the G and the K cars. So that's basically how the whole thing ran. But of course, every situation was difficult. No two pseudo seeds were the same. And there was a lot of preparation uh, involved in it. Otherwise, you're going to be compromised. Life was tough as a pseudo operator. There was nothing comfortable. You lived like a terrorist. You didn't have rations. You drank dirty water a lot of the time. You slept on the floor, you were dirty, you couldn't wash, couldn't brush your teeth, 
and after a few weeks you stake to high heaven, and that's where the cellar scouts got the the, 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 the walking objects. So that's that. <laughs> Some of the uh, well-known cellar scouts, and I made a list here. I'll have to read this because uh, I'll forget. Chris Schulenberg, Colin Chabata, Yanni Dell, Bert Sachs, Mont Chikondo, Dale Collett, Pete McNeilich, Edward Pettigondo, Mike Kerr, Jim Balaam, Ben Botha, who came from SES, Charlie Krauss, one of the early guys, Noel Roby, one of the early guys, Peter Willie van der Riet, and of course Bruce Simmons, Bruce Fitzsimmons, who I did quite a few pseudo jobs with. And to me, he was he was like the top guy. Basil Boss, Ed White, Rich Carver, uh, Petrus Wilanda, Head Wilanda, and many others. I mean, all the guys that Sally Scout had, you know, earned their colours, and they, they were good guys. Pseudo work all of the time, but they couldn't get involved much with external work, which was a completely thing, completely different thing that was run by our support commander, our TA guys uh, with vehicles. So we didn't have much chance of doing uh, external, but I did do one external, which was an op miracle. Now, this is quite a, an interesting op for me. I was tasked with taking in a pseudo group. And we were told that the terrorists, where they were attacked, they were told by the Flema that they should run back to Zimbabwe, to Rhodesia. Don't run back into the country. Don't run into Mozambique. They wanted them all to run back to Rhodesia. Uh, and we were positioned between Monte Cassino and Rhodesia. So we started off from Pedalonga and we walked in to Mozambique. And as we walked in, we were fired on. And I was a little bit confused. Were we compromised? Was it a greeting? We didn't really know. Anyway, we just carried on walking. So we were going in as terrorists, by the way, carrying suitcases as though we were coming back to be replenished in Mozambique before redeploying back into Rhodesia. Uh, as we walked in, this is where six heads came in. As we walked in, I saw a nice little feature that had quite a heavy foliage on. I thought we'd go and take up position there. And I, as I was sitting there, I looked over to Jean Desblay. I said, Jean, I've got a, a nasty feeling about this, this position we were in. He said, me too, Barry, in his French accent. He, by the way, also fought in the Congo. So I said, I think we better get out of here. Let's move from here to go find another location. So we walked off that little feature. We had only gone about 300 meters. Then all of a sudden, that little feature just exploded. I think we're still not sure to this day whether it was artillery or whether it was the tanks. But we had been definitely been compromised, and they stomped that little uh, feature. And every now and again, like every 500 meters or so, we walked away. They continually stomped us. So that went most, for most of that day up until last night. Uh, so that was a bit of a poor show there. But it was great walking down the valley and looking across at what was going on at Monte Cassino. Made me feel very proud of what our guys were managing to do there. Uh, now, as far as the, the firing was concerned, as I said, I didn't know where it was coming from or who it was coming from. The next day, uh, that night there was quite a bit of activity of vehicles going up and down, but none of them ever passed us. Uh, the, the next day I decided we'd just go for a little bit of a walk. So we started heading north. Uh, and as we were walking in a northerly direction. That's right. And I just happened to look back at my guys and I saw this hunter high up diving down towards us. And because we dressed as turs. I thought the hunter was attacking us. So I just said, take cover. And we just bombshelled. But the hunter just carried on straight over our heads and crashed about 500 meters ahead of us in a big black pube of smoke. And the hunter pilot, unfortunately, was Brian Gordon. So he died on that day, which was very, very sad. What had happened to him, Barry? Had he, was he shot down? He, with he, a... Yeah, he was shot down, yes. Anti, an anti-aircraft missile or...? Uh, no, I don't think it was missile. I think it was uh, AK-47. 
type of stuff, you know, twelve point seven or something like that. That I'm not sure of that. Yeah, but yeah. there was no smoke coming out of the the aircraft at all. It just came down silently over our heads. You didn't hear that whoosh of the jet engines. All was quiet. So I was completely confused what was going on. Then realised when it had crashed. What yeah. happened. But I didn't know that he'd actually shot out. I only learned that later. Yeah. It's funny, the next interview I'm going to be doing is with a hunter pilot, <laughs> uh, yeah, Stu, uh, Steve Murray. So but, um, and after that, everything went quiet. But that night, uh, we heard tanks moving towards our position. And I thought, this is going to be an opportunity to take out a tank. So I grabbed RPG-7 from one of my guys and took another two guys with me. And we moved forward towards the road. And I took up position waiting for the tanks. Then they stopped, turned around and went back. So that opportunity was lost. Uh, after that, all our guys pulled out. Uh, we thought we were going to be pulled out as well, but the boss said, no, we want, I want you to stay for a further few days, which we did. And I couldn't help but thinking, because now at this time, there was a lot of tank movement going around, vehicles with Frelimo, hell of a lot of Frelimo guys looking and searching in the bush looking for tours coming back or whatever they were doing or wanting to bolster their, their numbers. Uh, so, yeah, everything was very, very quiet. The powers that be thought that we shouldn't take a chance, lie low because the, the cloud cover was fairly low. We wouldn't be able to get any air support. Three days or four days after that, uh, we were told to pull out. We had a long walk back up to, to Pedalonga and uh, back to Coma. So that was that op miracle, 1979. I think it was Brian Gordon who was the poor pilot that, that died on that day. So yeah, then of course, 1980, after the elections, we were disbanded. A few of us were going to come down to the South African Army. I was going to come down to the South African Army. I was offered a substantive captain rank. I arrived at fire at Palabora, and my wife said she didn't want me to join the army again. So we had a bit of a I had a had a about that. So I said, no, I don't want to drive. I don't want to join fire Ricky. They said, would you like to go and have a look at one Ricky? So they flew me down from Pretoria to one Ricky. I had a look there. Uh, had an interview with. Uh, Commandant Besbier, and back to Pretoria. They said, look, let's send you down to Forecki. One of my black belts, Daddy Smith, who was also ex-SAS, uh, was with Forecki down in the Western Cape at Lagabad. He said, why don't you go down? Have a look there. It's very nice, different work altogether. So I went down and spent the day with Commandant Kinghorn, but then uh, my wife decided she didn't want me to join the Army, so I decided to give the Army a miss went overseas and studied to be a chiropractor, did the five-year course. I did two uh, degrees at once, chiropractic uh, degree and a radiology degree. Uh, then a little bit later, I did a master's degree. And then I did a conversion course to medicine uh, on the Dominican Republic. I did my internship in the Dominican Republic. But when I came back to South Africa, they said, you foreign trained medical doctors, all have to do another, uh, what do you call it, the word? Internship. internship, thanks to my wife. And I decided I was going to do another internship. I actually had two patients who, one was from Brazil, one was from Argentina, had spent five years doing internships, so they married over waste your time, cheap labor, they just use you. So I just decided to go back and uh, practice as a chiropractor, which I did for 37 years. Uh, Yes, my involvement with Scott McCormack, who had went to SAS later, was my first introduction to uh, karate. I then became a Rhodesian national coach. Today I'm a ninth dad and I'm the chief instructor of the International Shitoryu Sokokai Karate Association. Uh, so from St. Martin's home to where I am today, retired in the Western Cape, enjoying the easy life here. <clears throat> So yeah, that's my uh, mm -hmm. that's my story, John. Yeah, and I've got all the seven books here that I wrote. Yeah, let's have a uh, look. One is my autobiography. The other are all faction books. A little bit of fiction with a, amongst a lot of fact, and a lot of things come out of the, the, the books. 
which I haven't mentioned here for um, obvious reasons. Barry, how do you, people get hold of your book? On, are they all on Amazon? They're all on Amazon. They're all on Kindle ebook, and I have stocks here with me. So when they order, they just put the money in my bank account. Uh, they then pay for postage via PostNet to their PostNet wherever they want it, where they pick it up. Okay, Barry, can I put your email address in um, in the description Certainly. of the video, and then people can just email you if they want a book. Certainly, John. Yes, you okay. can. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I think you have sent me a, a few of the book covers so that I can, I'll I'll put those on the video as well. But um, okay, Barry, thank you so much, brother. It's been fascinating listening to you. Uh, I, I also was also a martial arts sensei for about twenty years. Yes, and yeah, uh, you told me and trained with the Japanese, and so yeah, uh, it's fascinating to listen to your to your story, and I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Pleasure, John. Thanks for having me.